grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, the Alpha, the Omega, Jesus Christ. There are few verses of the Bible that cause as much controversy. There are few verses of the Bible that rile people up into as much of a tizzy as this one. There are few verses of the Bible that cause even well-meaning good Christians to do logical backflips to get away from what it plainly says as Romans 13, verse 1. I want to preach on, I want to focus on our lesson from Daniel, but the words that you heard from Paul, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority that exists except that which God has established. That creates a little bit of tension. All Christians are called to wrestle with how to put that into practice. Now, and I, I want to give you a couple of disclaimers. This is a sermon about government. This is not a sermon about politics. So let's set that aside, shall we? I am not about to tell you, based on the Bible, how you should vote, how you should act in the political sphere. That's for you to determine and apply to yourself on your way out this morning. But my other disclaimer is this. Is it possible? Can we do this? Can we set aside our opinions, our emotional reactions to our government, our political thoughts about what we think they should be doing differently, what we love about what they're currently doing, or what we wish they would do differently in the future. Can we just set that aside for one second and sit at the feet of our God and hear like little children once again what he has to say? Are we sincere? Can we be sincere about what we sang in our opening hymn about letting God speak first? I think we can, and I think we will, and so let's proceed with that. But I'm not going to deny you the right to have your emotional reaction to Romans 13, verse 1. In fact, I wonder how Daniel, in our Old Testament lesson, would have reacted had he heard those words. Paul wrote Romans probably 700-ish years after the events of our first lesson. I wonder how Daniel would have responded. Because Daniel's not in a very godly society. If you want to talk about a corrupt government where wickedness and evil has permeated every level of society, Daniel's right there with you. If you want to talk about living in a world where people are treating each other in heinous and wicked and evil and violent ways, Daniel completely understands. If you want to talk about looking at the behavior of people around you, what you hear on the news, and, just, and not knowing what to do about it, that's what Daniel's going through too. How did he get there? The nation of Babylon has come in and it has conquered the nation of Judah, the southern part of Israel. Babylon has ransacked Judah. It destroyed the temple. And like many nations did in this day and age, it handpicked, Babylon handpicked its favorites from the nation it conquered. It picked the people that it thought could serve its government the best. And so as you heard in the lesson, Babylon chose the best and the brightest. And so Daniel, he committed the egregious atrocity of being intelligent, of being attractive, it says. He was good looking in appearance. And now modern studies have confirmed that attractive people, people who are physically attractive, command more respect, tend to get promotions faster, tend to be entrusted with more. And so that's probably what, where the good looking and appearance thing comes in. And so Daniel is rewarded for his native ability. And he's rewarded with a position helping the king that destroyed his homeland. Daniel is handpicked. What a special guy. And what he is handpicked for, the responsibility he is given, is to help, is to serve the very nation that tore him away from his family and bulldozed his church. And you know what's even worse? They changed his name. The name that Daniel's mom and dad spoke over him as a baby. 
the name that D Daniel's family lifted up in prayer every night before he could talk, the name that they screamed across the house when L Daniel's little chubby toddler legs got onto the table and he was about to fall off, and the name that they screamed when they saw him put in those shackles and led off in a trail of slaves. You're no longer Daniel, they said. You're a Babylonian now. You are Belteshazzar, which probably means protect the king. His name is now a prayer for the Babylonian gods to come to the aid of the king that has enslaved him. Every time he hears from this day forward, Belteshazzar, come do this, he's hearing that homage paid to pagan false gods. Doesn't your heart just break for Daniel? Aren't you just so mad at the situation that he's in? Doesn't this trigger our rage at the situation that he has to face? I mean, what would you do if you were Daniel? I was watching a movie on Friday night where someone was held in captivity against their will. They got free eventually. Don't mean to spoil the ending. I won't tell you which movie it was. But as soon as this person woke up, they instantly got to trying to escape. They were clawing. They were scratching at their restraints. They used a pole to try to grab their phone across the room. And then once they got their phone, they tried to call for help. They did everything they could as soon as they found out that they were held against their will to escape. Isn't that a metaphor for how we would react if we were in Daniel's situation? I mean, he's held against his will. He is held captive to a government that is wicked and evil and perverse. Daniel, poke the eyes of your captors. Grab something and bonk them on the head. Run as fast as you can in the direction of Judah because it would be better to die alone in the desert than to serve a tyrant, right? Tyranny must be resisted. But you already know that that's not what Daniel does. Does that kind of tug at your heartstrings? Then we got to be careful. We got to tread lightly here, brothers and sisters. We are never trying to excuse. And the Bible never excuses wicked leaders doing and promoting wickedness. It is never okay for a leader to use their leadership as a cover-up for sin, whether we're talking about the president of a nation or an abusive father in a household. God never is okay with authority figures using their authority to harm and to go against his word. But what we're dealing with here, brothers and sisters, is what is our reaction? How are we meant to respond to a situation like this? Well, we have options that Daniel didn't, right? We can vote. You can write to your governing officials. You can make your voice heard. You can protest. Daniel, democracy was not a thing in his society. And neither was separation of church and state. The Babylonian government, the Babylonian religion, worshiping even the emperor and all these detestable gods, that was on every level. That affected absolutely everything. But what's our role? How do we respond? I'm not saying it's bad to vote. I'm not saying it's bad to be active. I'm not saying it's bad to state what you believe. But why? Why are you? Hasn't there been at least one time that I've gone to the polls and I thought, well, if just the right gentleman or lady can get in the right position, then people can start acting right. Then we can start doing our thing as Christians. As if getting people to act right is all we care about, not about people's hearts and souls. Or haven't I looked to my favorite news anchor, my outlet, my subreddit for truth? instead of to God in his Bible. Haven't I treated people with dismissal because of what I think they think, not because of who they actually are or what they're actually saying? Brothers and sisters, in Babylon, the idolatry was obvious. The king called himself a god. The god's statues were everywhere. Modern America? It's a little more subtle, but it's still there. 
We are not called upon to sacrifice our children in the fire to Marduk or Chemosh, but you are called upon to put your faith, your trust, in your security in a color, blue or red, or in an animal, donkey or elephant. You are not called to trust in Chemosh to make the crops grow, but you're called to trust in one person to make all your dreams come true, and they're banking on you to trust in that so they can secure your vote. Brothers and sisters, the idolatry has always been there. It just takes on different forms. So what do we do? Daniel did take his stand. He did stand up for what he believed in. He definitely did. When things got tough, he, he stood up on his two feet and he ordered a salad. The world is burning around him and Daniel's mind goes to chickpeas and tomatoes. What? Daniel, you had no problem when you were led off as a slave, as an exile into Babylon. You let them change your name. Let them dictate what your identity is. But meat is the issue? Not exactly. It's not meat per se. This is not a proof passage for a vegetarian diet. I'm sorry. This is the issue at stake is what has been done to the meat. The king, he enjoys cuts of beef, legs of lamb every single day. But Daniel knows that that cut of beef, that leg of lamb, has been offered in sacrifice to a false god. Daniel is not willing to partake in a dinner where before the dinner, uh, a prayer for grace has been said, but it's been said to Molech and Chemosh and to the emperor himself, not to the one true God. Daniel will have none of it. And so Daniel's here I stand moment, Daniel's standing up for the truth moment, is when he is directly commanded to do something that violates his covenant relationship with God. I'm not going to, he says. What does Daniel understand that we should understand? What does he say to his guards, to his captives? Daniel then said to the guard with the, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that that of the young men who eat the royal food, and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better and nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine and they were to drink, and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of them, uh, end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. Every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. You don't hear his name very much in this lesson. At least not the way you think. But who is present the whole time? God. God was there when Babylon entered Judah and bulldozed the temple. God was present when Daniel was led off into exile. God was present even in exile, even with a pagan, wicked, evil nation who, which did inexcusable things. Daniel refused to believe that because these terrible things were going on, God had lost control. Daniel refused to accept the responsibility for himself to personally regain control for God. Daniel saw his faith as something to be lived, not as something to be protected. Daniel saw his God as someone who is in control no matter what. See, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of news 
being shared out there that is designed, that is phrased in such a way to get you to panic, to get you to wonder if God is still in control. Well, he always has been. Before the creation of the world, his, his authority was supreme. Even when the human race fell into sin, God remained in control and gave us the promise of a Savior. Even when God sent his own Son into our midst, and he took on flesh, and a corrupt government put him to death, God did not lose control. He never does. To quote the famous theologian George Costanza, we live in a society. A society is nothing more complicated than a group. A group united by a common goal or idea or set of criteria. You live in a society. You live in God's society. Not only were you created by him, but when you rebelled, revolted against him, he struck peace with you by striking his son on a cross. Even when you turned tail and run, ran in the opposite direction because you would rather face death than be united to a God like him when you were stuck in your sin, God won you over. Jesus campaigned for you and won your heart through the gospel. And he united into your greatest citizenship at your baptism. And you were baptized into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you think any human ruler can take that away from you, no matter how wicked they are? Absolutely not. No one's authority trumps God's. But you know what the other sad part is about changing Daniel's name? is what Daniel means. Don E. Ale, my judge, is God. There is no higher authority than God's, Daniel was saying, with his name. There is no one whose opinion of me matters more than God's. Daniel, with his name, was saying that. There is no one who can take over God's throne. There is no one whose court is higher than God's. And God is my judge. That's your confession too. Except maybe you say it in a little bit different of a way. God is my judge sounds a lot like Jesus is my Lord. That's what marks a citizen of God's society. Does it feel though like being a Christian is like belonging to a secret society, like we're in a club that we have to hide from people, it doesn't have to. If that were the case, this would be the worst place to gather, don't you think? On a big, bright church on a hill where everyone can see. If we're trying to keep this a secret, we're not doing a very good job. But that's not what it's about. Daniel was not keeping his faith a secret. He was not a monk. He was not a seclusionist. He was not a quietist or a pacifist or whatever word people are throwing around these days. He was not divorced from the situation he was in, but he was active. He participated in his society, but he participated by making his faith known by his actions and by serving. For Daniel, that looked like ordering a salad. That was his confession. That was his service. I am just guessing. I'm going way out on a limb that your service, your confession, will look differently. But it is no different in the essence, in the motivation, in the purpose. So whereas Daniel ordered a salad, maybe you go to the polls and you vote according to what you believe to be right. You vote according to what representative you think will best be, will fit best for our community and for our country. But on your way af out after voting, you will look with kindness and compassion on those who disagree with you. Maybe you will be active in a community group that champions a cause that God agrees with in his Bible. 
but you will also champion compassion and love in your conversation with others. It might not look like ordering a salad for you, but while you order your salad at Denny's or wherever, you'll watch what you say. Not because you're afraid that people might hear the truth and get offended, but because you want to speak the truth about your Savior's love for people, not just about how people should act. To God's society, brothers and sisters, those of us who belong to God in the name of, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it's no secret. You realize what a breath of fresh air it is? In this world of everything has to be a hot take, to hear a Christian react with patience and understanding and even curiosity, do you realize how, what a breath of fresh air that is for people when you do that? In a world that's trying to get you, like the Pharisees were trying to get Jesus to come down hard on one side without, without any nuance, without understanding the other side, to hear you react with compassion. To, you, to hear you ask questions. In a world that is so quick to judge, to see you, members of God's society, who are quick to love. You realize what a breath of fresh air that is. When we just live out who we are in God, when we live out our confession about things that matter, but about the God who matters and his love that conquers all. Amen. Mm -hmm.